session. I've already got some questions in the hopper. Uh, I'm going to put a quick thing in the chat about uh, my Patreon supporters, thanking them for underwriting this activity. Everybody else should probably be thanking them as well. If you're not a supporter, they're the ones who help me earn a living doing this sort of thing. And they're the ones who are underwriting it. If it wasn't for them, I would not uh, really have the time to do it. So a lot of greetings people are giving me. That's that's very nice. Uh, we got 22 people already on. Let's jump to some of the questions. So um, I had a few minutes to look at these ahead of time. And the first question is actually kind of a tough one for me. Um, it's... Uh, who is my favorite contemporary feminist thinker? And I don't really have a good answer for that in part because, you know, I don't really um, do a lot within that, that field. Most of the feminist thinkers that I tend to read and teach. Um, and I was thinking, well, do I have any colleagues who I, I identify that identify as feminists and whose works I, I really like, and I was thinking, yeah, I do, but most of them are not doing it simply just as feminists. They're doing it because they're interested in, say, ancient philosophy and how it, you know, impacts um, modern life. And then they're, they're trying to think things out, like how would we take Aristotle and read him in such a way that the the boneheaded things he says about women could be addressed, but in an Aristotelian perspective. So I don't I don't really have a, a great answer for that. Um, I mean, there's a lot of important feminist thinkers out there, but I don't I don't really focus on a lot of people just as feminists as such. I mean, you know, my my favorite 20th century woman thinker is not really contemporary. She's been dead a while. It's Hannah Arendt. But, you know, uh, that, that's when, you, when you've got a archives and you've got a center devoted to you, as they do at Bard College, um, that's a sign that you've been gone for a while. All right, let me jump into Heidegger stuff. So I'm going to take the, the second question on Heidegger first and then talk about the uh, first one, which is a little bit more difficult. Um, Louis, Louise Gerardo asks, why do you think Heidegger is still relevant today? Well, because the, some of the stuff that he said is, um, you know, you, you could say there, there's sort of, to use Th Thucydides or no, it's Herodotus' uh, idea of an achievement for eternity, you know, tema a possession for eternity. There's, you know, some insights that he has, uh, many of which you can find in Being in Time, that I think are extremely valuable. The, the relationship between mood, situation, or if you, most people like to call it, you know, thrownness, Geworfenheit, um, and for, you know, pre-understanding, uh, and then discourse or language, Aida. I think that's a brilliant insight. Um, I think he was wrong in, in assuming that anxiety is the only, uh, you know, really primordially revelatory mood, uh, but there's other people out there like Adrian Pepperzak who, who talk about that quite well. Um, you know, his, his views on uh, the essence of technology, I think that there's a lot of good stuff there. Um, you know, there, there's a, you could say there, there's a number of different points where Heidegger is either relevant to the particular situation that we're in or the insights that he had remain uh, relevant to the human condition uh, for the foreseeable future. But you could say that about so many other philosophers. Why, why is Aristotle relevant today? Why is um, Gabriel Marcel relevant today? Now, uh, there's a question here about Heidegger and being. What is being in the Heideggerian sense? So, and it's lowercase b in the question. This is from Nabil. Um, so Heidegger talks about beings, right? Zion does. He talks about being, Zion, capital case B. And then he talks about the being of beings, uh, lowercase b, lowercase b, plural. And those are not the same thing, right? So you might be asking about what is being capital B in a Heideggerian sense. And, and you could say, well, in some way, it's the totality of, of beings, but it also includes the nothing, and it includes 
our own involvement in it as the kind of being that is Dasein that is concerned with being and concerned with its own being. Um, and the other thing I'll say about this, because I, I do want to get on to the other questions, is Heidegger thinks that um, throughout uh, the history of ideas in the West, there are a number of productive misunderstandings of being capital B. Uh, so Plato is one of the first people to do this. And then Aristotle has a different one. And then um, he kind of jumps over the Hellenistic philosophers right into the Christian thinkers. Um, but you could say a similar thing for the Hellenistic philosophers and, and so on, all the way down to Nietzsche, who is, in Heidegger's view, the last metaphysician. Um, in each case, some, some kind of being, lowercase b, what he calls a region of being, is taken as being determinative of the other beings, lowercase b, plural. And it sort of substitutes in there for being, uppercase b, being. Um, and so, you know, with Plato, we take the forms, the, the, the ede or idei, idei as being being, right? Or we take the form of forms, not the form of forms, the form of the good, the form of the beautiful. Um, as being the being. Um, with Christianity, it becomes God. With Hegel, it becomes spirit. Uh, you know, with Nietzsche, it becomes will to power, right? And each of these is something that's a productive misunderstanding because it introduces something new, a new way of looking at things that is, in some respects, useful for some kinds of beings. But it, it, it's wrong insofar as it is trying to take all of being and, and put it in there. All right. Let me, oh, there's already quite a few things here. Let me jump to the next ones. Uh, Crowbar, do I agree or disagree with the notion there's an epidemic of narcissism spreading across the United States in the modern digital era? Um, well, so let's clarify there. Are we talking about narcissism in the clinical sense or are we talking about it in sort of a pop culture sense? Clinical sense, I don't know that there's been a you know greater prevalence of narcissistic personality disorder being diagnosed, but um, in you know in a pop culture loosey goosey kind of sense, eh, maybe. Um, I don't know that it's simply tied to the digital era. I think that it could be, you know, a result of many other things, and I don't know that there's an epidemic of it. Um, I would say people have in general are narcissistic in that that sense and it happened long before the digital era a lot a lot of people are kind of selfish and self-centered and you know have their blinders on and are primarily concerned about how things are going to affect them i think that's kind of a constant throughout uh most most cultures and most most eras uh do we want to call that narcissism or do we want to reserve that term for when it becomes a bit more pathological i don't know that's a that's that's kind of an open question um, I, I would say I don't observe more of it in my students in this contemporary generation than I did in the previous generation. And I've been teaching now for 20 years. So, you know, I, I'm not seeing it myself. Um, oh, wow. This is a tough one. Francis. Francis always asks good questions. <laughs> What are the most important intellectual skills not often taught to new philosophers? What hardcore intellectual exercises can train them? Wow, that that that's a that's a great question. That probably should you know that could use a blog entry or a video. Um, one is like how to handle criticism and rejection well, and I don't think that people really spend much time on that. Um, until rejection happens and they're like, well, you know, get back on the horse. Uh, and, and, or they're like, well, I remember what it was like, but we don't, we don't deal with it in a sort of coherent way. And that, that is an important, um, that is an important aspect of, of academics as well as of so many other things, romantic life, you know, the job market. Um, now are there intellectual exercises that could help you with that? Yeah. Um, I mean, this is where like Stoicism and I think other perspectives like Platonism and Aristotelianism um, offer us helpful uh, things. Also, existentialist perspectives 
offer us helpful um, ways of preparing for that. Uh, you know, the the negative visualization exercises that are important for for stoicism um, are a good example of that. Although you know those those are not unique to stoicism. There's many Christian thinkers who who do similar things as well. And um, what else is needed? Um, being able to you know, a lot of the skills are really like emotional management skills and, and emotional management, not just in the sense of like understanding your emotions and, and dealing with them, but seeing how they connect up with cognitions, because there's a tendency for philosophers to become a little bit over intellectual and to ignore what's going on within the totality of their psyches, uh, myself included. You know, I, I speak from experience on that. Um, Learning how to have productive conversations with people who you disagree with without coming across as a condes condescending sort of prick, um, that's, that's a useful skill. <laughs> that's not really well taught or modeled in philosophy departments. But that, that's a great question. Uh, that's one I'd actually, I think I'd like to think about more. So Francis, you should email me and remind me about that because I have a few other things that I have to uh, get out this weekend in terms of writing, but that, that's something I would like to, to do. Uh, awful philosophy. Uh, what about Adorno do you like? You've mentioned him and enjoying his thought in the past, but never with much detail. So he's not somebody who I, I've read recently, quite honestly. And by recently, I mean like in the last couple of years. Um, the last time I was digging into him was, was just reading through the aesthetic theory. Um, Adorno is, is a very difficult thinker to read in part because there's so much packed in there and he's engaging in reflection constantly and he references so many different things. Um, I would say Adorno is, as far as like getting a lot out of him, is at the level of toughness of Hegel. Um, what I do enjoy is that he gives me a lot of great insights about how things could be looked at in different ways or how they're connected with each other. Um, you know, I mean, you read some things and you're like, well, probably off base on this, but you can say the same thing about Heidegger. You can say the same thing about Aristotle, or you can say the same thing about Hegel, right? Um, my very first, no, not the very first. I think that I, I published one other thing before that, but my, one of my very early publications was actually on Adorno. Um, and I considered doing my master's thesis on him. But instead, I wound up um, doing it on uh, Husserl and, and de Saussure. So, um, Nicholas de Salentio, do you have any other U philosophy YouTubers you suggest? Um, I don't really spend much time watching other people's videos, in part because I, I don't have the time. People ask me this about podcasts. What podcast do you listen to? Uh, well, not much because I spend so much time either reading or meeting with clients, you know, in my, my work, doing tutorials, consulting, uh, or, you know, producing videos or, or producing sound files or producing online classes. I don't, I don't get much time to watch other people. So I can't make any competent <laughs> recommendations. Um, Adam Titor, what is it to understand? That's one of those, you know, questions sort of like Augustine, you know, in, in Confessions. What's time? So long as nobody asks me, I grasp it perfectly fine. As soon as somebody asks me, now I don't really know. <laughs> understanding, uh, you know, it depends. I think I think understanding is one of those polysemic or ambiguous, meaning it has more than one meaning and they're connected together kind of terms. Um, and it, here's something I'll say too. It means sometimes something different in one school or movement of philosophy than it does in another. So for example, you'll see in the Middle Ages, people making a distinction between the intellect or understanding, uh, the intellectus, and reason, ratio. Reason is discursive, understanding is more kind of holistic, intuitive, grasping everything all at once. And then it gets totally reversed with the German idealists where um, Understanding becomes something, you know, more or less of, of the concepts in this worldly and and uh, reason is a higher faculty. So I, I would say um, 
there's different modes of understanding, you know, there's understanding that something is the case. There's understanding how to do something. And notice that this is similar to the, the issue of like, what is it to know? There's more than one mode of knowledge as well. Uh, Cyrex is asking me about something that uh, I don't think can be done. How do you convince an entire humanity to sacrifice their wants for the needs of the children of the future? Well, I mean, you don't. It's tough enough convincing everybody that they should eat at the same restaurant, <laughs> let alone that, or that we should have pizza tonight, let alone that um, all of humanity ought to sacrifice their wants for the needs of the children of the future. So I'd say, first off, you want to sort of zero in on the people who you can, in fact, influence. Um, some people you're not going to make any headway with. Uh, for a variety of different reasons. So you want to, you know, this is where I, I would say the interface between philosophy and rhetoric is quite important, right? Right, Because oftentimes philosophers make a case and they don't attend to the audience that they are communicating with. And you, you do want to pay attention to what will actually be persuasive with this group of people or this group of people or, you know, why. And, and, and I think it would take a lot of discussions. I was talking about this with one of my clients yesterday, uh, a psychotherapist who actually runs a center and does training, and I'm, I'm helping him, uh, you know, incorporate a lot of ethics materials into the training for his practicing psychotherapists. And I was saying nobody's ever convinced by a philosophical argument just by itself. I mean, Maybe that does happen once in a while. I've never seen it. I've never seen anyone ever totally change their position just because somebody made an argument. There has to be a lot of other factors coming in that may look, you know, kind of non-rational or or uh, only semi-rational, but but which play a part. And and a lot of good philosophers have recognized this and a lot of good philosophers have also not recognized this and acted as if somehow just by putting an idea or a set of ideas out there, they're going to change people's minds. It takes, it takes more than that. Um, Chip, when I taught in the prison, were there any trends in the philosophers, issues, movements, et cetera, that my students there were interested in? It was pretty wide gamut of stuff. I was fortunate in that they tended to be older than the typical college students. I did have a few like, you know, 20 year olds, but they were mostly like 25 on up to like, you know, 60 or so. And they, they were interested in things that would be applicable to the life that they were living in there. So, you know, stoicism was, was always a perennial favorite. Um, but they were also very interested in <clears throat> social and political philosophy they're very interested in philosophy of religion. I also taught religious studies courses. So there was a good bit of overlap because I taught world religions and religion in American culture and the various scripture classes. Um, and there was some interest in epistemological issues, but they, they did not have much patience for the sort of typical, you know, analytic epistemology that, that people do these days because they, they didn't see it. I mean, they, they saw through it. Um, they were very quite, some of them were quite interested in metaphysics. Um, and, you know, I taught a huge range of classes. I mean, I, I taught not just intro and in ethics and logic, but the entire history uh, of philosophy sequence and special topics, business ethics, social political philosophy. Um, I think I taught about 11 or 12 different philosophy courses while I was there. So, yeah. Um, Severi, another question about relevance. How relevant is Michel Foucault these days, in my opinion? Um, you know, it's sort of like with, with Heidegger. Foucault has some interesting ideas, like his distinction between exploitation, domination, and subjectiv subjectivization, I think is brilliant. Um, you know, I, I don't buy into his histories of... Uh, institutions or his history of sexuality, the ancient period. I think quite often Foucault tells a story that's partially true and then partially sort of, well, it could be, maybe this way, you know, kind of conspiracy theory stuff. But he, he does have some interesting insights. There are quite a few people in sociology who use him. He, he made his way into other fields besides philosophy. Um, 
I can tell you that when it comes to like criminology, criminologists don't give a, give a lot of credence to discipline and punish because it's it's a little bit too restrictive um, and it's it, too easy for people to try to extrapolate out about it. But um, he's got he's got a lot of really interesting ideas. I, I like Foucault quite a bit. Uh, Nicholas writes, Camille Paglia is my favorite feminist thinker. Yeah, she's somebody I like. I, I haven't read any of her books for quite a while. But, you know, when, when an op-ed piece comes up, I'll read her. I kind of Part of what I like about her is that she she's not a party liner, you know. Um, she wants to say, listen, you're leaving this out or you're leaving this out. Um, and, and it's usually something, you know, more is something, something important, not just for, for that discourse, but, but the rest that the rest of us can relate to. I wouldn't say that's important. Um, I don't have an answer for Nimi 07, scientific realism or instrumentalism. Both of those things mean so many different things. I have no idea what's what's intended by them here. Those those are just sort of jargon terms that that people use to describe like entire programs. But there's more than one scientific realism out there. There's more than one notion of instrumentalism. Um, Adam, most of the contemporary thinkers are Marxists. Why? I don't know that that's the case at all, that most of the contemporary thinkers are Marxists. Um, you know, there's some that are Marxists, and then there's some that are like, yeah, there's something to Marx, but that doesn't make you a Marxist. I mean, I'm a Marxist if that's all it takes to to, to be a Marxist, uh, you know, but I'm not any more than I am a, you know, straight out Aristotelian or just party line Stoic or anything like that. Um, I, I, so I think it, here's here's a good upshot. It's important to not mistake thinking that Marx has something contri to, to contribute with being a sort of convinced, I belong to the party, everything must be filtered through Marx kind of Marxist. Um, all right. Proof Architect, would you accept some superhero comics, post-80s Batman, V for Vendetta, Swamp Thing, anime and Japanese, some Western video games as good areas for speculative fiction for the beginner philosopher? So that would be a question that would be better addressed to somebody who actually um, reads those, those <clears throat> sorts of things or plays uh, video games or um, watches anime regularly. And I'm, I'm not any of those. Um, my exposure to anime largely comes through my son's interest in it. And so that's when he's here, we'll watch stuff together. And then he'll correct me about this plot line or this person. And, and, uh, and I, I don't really, you know, I used to read comic books when I was much younger um, but I didn't read Batman and I, I didn't read V for Vendetta or Swamp Thing. I mean, I was into the X-Men and I was into uh, Judge Dredd and Halo Jones and, and things like that. Well, and, uh, everything that came out through first too, like the Badger and, and uh, what was it? There was another one that was really good. Um, but it's, you know, I gave away my comics back in the nineties to some kid who really liked them. So, I mean, in theory, could that sort of thing be good for speculative fiction? I guess. Um, it probably depends a lot on who's doing the writing. I will say one thing that, um, you know, I, I in my, my Worlds of Speculative Fiction series, I focus on, on books, and I focus ju generally on series of books because I want a coherent narrative universe. Um, but we often end up talking about movies and TV shows, and there's a lot of great, TV stuff out there right now. Uh, Westworld, a uh, prime example, exploring some really interesting questions uh, and not in a heavy-handed way or not in a sloppy way, The uh, how they're often done. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing the uh, new um, um, Man in the High Castle out, and, and yeah, there's the whole issue of whether how far off book it is, right? I mean, it's not really that connected anymore to Philip K. Dick's novel, which is actually one of my favorite works by Dick, The Man in the High Castle. Um, but it's pretty cool what's what's being explored. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of room out there for exploring um, exploring uh, 
speculative fiction and the philosophical themes in it in, in a lot of uh, different ways. So I, I don't have, uh, but I don't have much stuff to say about um, comic books, unfortunately, or anime. All right. I've got a question from three by four architecture. Am I familiar with Nick Land, Joshua Gunn, and Michael Tsarian? Um, they're all names that I've, I've read. And I think I might, unless I'm, no, I'm mistaking him for somebody else. Um, Nick Land, somebody else had recommended him to me. Uh, let me look up real quick. Uh, what is his story? Um, oh, accelerationism. Um, I haven't really spent much time, uh, looking into to that sort of stuff again, you know, who, who's got the, the time I would, I would need some, uh, some, uh, um, time, you know, set aside in order to do that. It says he's connected with the dark enlightenment. Um, when it comes to dark enlightenment stuff, I've mostly read mold bug. And when I read him, I'm like, well, there's Jacques Maras again. Uh, Maras, for those who don't know, was a uh, neo-reactionary thinker from the uh, early part of the 20th century, radicalized by the Dreyfus affair, helped found Action Francaise. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, no, I'm, I'm afraid I, I, I don't have much, much to say about any of those people, but they sound interesting. I wish I had the time to follow up on, on all these things that are interesting. All right. Um, Dubs thoughts on essentialism in general and in social sense, um, essentialism, again, one of those terms, this is going to be my sort of standard response to jargon terms. What do you think about such and such ism? What do you mean by it? If you mean do things have essences, I've got no problem with that. Uh, we don't have to say they all have essences in the same way. Usually essentialism is kind of a slur word that people use. You're being an essentialist because you're saying people of, of uh, you know, this type or all this way. There's a better way to say that. You're being a dumb prejudice person and, and, and not actually observing what's in front of your face and making a priori judgments about people, you know. Um, so I, I, I don't know. It, there's, there, you know, it depends on what kind of essentialism we're talking about. Um, here's another jargony one. Do you believe Kant was more of a moral constructivist rather than a moral realist like Rawls did? Um, I mean, so usually moral realism is this notion that there are like, you know, moral norms are reflective of something that's actually like out there in, in the, the universe. Um, and you can say somebody like, like Hegel is, is both a moral realist and a moral, uh, constructivist. Constructivists are saying it's, it's basically something that we, if, through linguistic practices or culture or whatever, we construct those. Um, Kant is a moral realist in that he thinks that, uh, there, you know, there are some things that are clearly identifiable through the, you know, the rational, uh, the exercise of the rational mind as, uh, moral norms that are categorically binding. Now, are they out there in the world in the same way that like natural laws are? No, uh, they are laws that freedom gives itself. Um, I mean, you can 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 you reinterpret Kant in whatever way you like? Sure, you can do that with any thinker. You could turn uh, uh, you know Aristotle into a hardcore conservative or into a you know. Uh, super progressive, but then you're kind of deforming things along the way, aren't you? Um, Dave, I teach philosophy and play the banjo too, bluegrass style. How's your picking going? I don't put in enough practice. Um, quite frankly, I, I don't play a lot of classical banjo stuff. I don't. I definitely don't play bluegrass. So I play some old timey stuff, but mostly it's it's playing rock stuff of various sorts, um, and, and you know, learning the the roles and and things like that is just a means to an end i'm more interested in playing ufo or motorhead or judas priest than i am in, in other things so um all right andrew can i explain the schism between deleuze guitari's work and lacan i'm not too familiar with either camp's work but find the guitari lacan relationship fascinating humorous um i don't know about the relationship between guitari and lacan personally I, I, you know, I work on Lacan stuff. I don't do much with Deleuze and Guattari uh, in part because, well, there's two reasons. One is um, 
you know, I don't, I, you don't only have so much time. And, and I, you know, I read the stuff back in graduate school. The other thing is uh, I get turned off by Delusians who everything is rhizomatic and, you know, anything can be anything. Um, quite frankly, the stuff by Deleuze that I like the best is where he's not actually working with guitar. <laughs> so like his, his essays, critical and clinical, you know, I, I, I'm not, I think that's what the English translation is. Uh, uh, but I mean, if we think about it in this, this way, right. Um, in a way, it makes sense for Deleuze and Guattari to think Lacan didn't go far enough in reacting against the psychoanalytic establishment. I think one of the things that's helpful as background knowledge when you're reading Deleuze and Guattari is to realize if you're not in France, that France is very, very different than say the United States when it came to like psychiatric care. The United States, we had a whole bunch of different theories in play and different people doing different things. And um, in France, the psychoanal psychoanalysts really dominated, and they were not just psychoanalysts all getting along together. There was kind of a doctrinaire way of doing things, and Deleuze and Guattari are reacting against that in Anti-Oedipus, and people like Lacan, um, who do think that there's something to the Oedipus complex, although Lacan himself relativizes it quite a bit, um, saying, you know, that it doesn't apply cross-culturally, um, they're sort of collateral damage, I, I guess you could say. Uh, Ricky asks, what do I think of the concept of Robert A. Heinlein moral philosophy? You mean like a, a moral philosophy that would be Heinleinian? Um, Heinlein went through different phases. You know, he, he identified as a libertarian quite a bit, so I, I don't see why he would necessarily need to have a Heinlein philosophy. Why not just focus on um, libertarianism and, and use things to illustrate it from his works. I mean, A. Van Vogt uh, would be another figure in there like that a little bit earlier. All right. Um, Tara, how would you compare or contrast Edmund Burke's reflections on the revolution in France with de Meist's? It's interesting to see the conservative and traditionalist response to the same event. That, I'd have to spend time reading it. It's been a, a long time since I've read Burke. Um, and uh, De Meist, I was only really interested in because he fit into this discussion about traditionalism leading to Action Francaise, and then also um, uh, figuring in with the Christian philosophy debates because Emile Breillet brought him up. Uh, as uh, him and de Bonald and, and others as an example of a failed attempt at Christian philosophy. Um, so I don't, I don't have much to say about that. Uh, here's a very broad question from Vladino. Would you say philosophers live in a dream world? Um, no, not, not generally. I mean, there may be some philosophers who do, right? Uh, generally, it helps to be independently wealthy, like have a trust fund or have a really great academic position if you want to live in a dream world. Because for the rest of us, you know, there's the reality principle of got to, you know, deal with things. You smack into a wall if you just keep walking. There's nobody there to clear it away for you. Um, and if you, if you think that you can do whatever you like or say whatever you like, uh, and you're not going to face repercussions for it, then mm, that, that's not, that doesn't work out for most of us. Um, you know, most philosophers live in the same, same sort of general world as, as everybody else. They just also do philosophy. So, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Muhammad, who critiqued Kant in epistemology and how was that? Who didn't critique Kant in epistemology? I mean, uh, you know, uh, the whole German idealism is, is essentially reacting to Kant, right? You've got uh, Hegel and Schelling and before them Fichte, they're all improving on Kant, Schopenhauer, Kant got this right, he got this wrong, you know, uh, even, you know, people who are, are totally against them like Jacobi, um, you know, lots of people have critiqued Kant and then it's kept on going on. So, all right. Nimi, uh, do you watch counter contrapoints? Uh, no, I, I'm not even sure what it is. Sacco, do you think Spinoza was a Stoic and how he formulated his notion of affects in book three of the ethics? I do not think Spinoza was a Stoic. I think Spinoza is a Spinozian. I think he's doing his own thing. 
And I think that you can say that there's similarities in some respects to Stoics on some things, but, um, you know, ultimately he's, he's got his own project going, you know, and he's, he's working in a, in a different sort of medium too than the Stoics were. Uh, here's a flattering question from Max. How did I get so handsome? Uh, if, if indeed there is any handsomeness, that would probably be more a matter of genetics than anything else, you know? Uh, and, uh, you know, I do personal hygiene. So <laughs> if I didn't do that, that would probably be a problem. Uh, Jermel, if I had to choose between the Epicurean school and Cyrenaic school, which one seems closer to the original definition of hedonism? So there is no original definition of hedonism. Um, hedonism is just a term we use to talk about theories that make pleasure the good. Um, but if I had to choose between being an Epicurean and being a Cyrenaic, I'd probably be a Cyrenaic. You know, if you're going to just make pleasure the, the primary good, you know, why try to sort of couch it in terms of these mental pleasures and, you know, freedom from pain and stuff like that. Ah, hell, go for pleasure. Try to arrange your life in such a way that you're going to get as much of it as possible. Um, oh, wow. Jeff, what are the most underrated platonic dialogues, in my opinion? Oh, that is a good one. Underrated platonic dialogues. So I'm going to answer this in a very subjective way. I'll, I'll talk about the ones that I really like that I don't see a lot of people uh, paying as much attention to. Because, you know, I like a lot. I really like the platonic dialogues in general. Um, and everyone's, oh, the symposium is so excellent. And it is excellent, right? And, oh, you got to read The Republic. And that's true. You do need to read The Republic. Um, I, I think the Credo is one that's well worth reading and often gets overlooked. People read it and they're just like, I just want to jump right to the argument about the laws, you know, because it's a social contract theory. And they skip over all the other stuff at the beginning that I think is really quite cool. Um, I love the Gorgias. The Gorgias is a very rich dialogue. There's a lot going on in there. I also really like the Protagoras. Um, that's, that's, there's a lot of cool stuff. I don't see a lot of people referencing that. Um, as a matter of fact, I, you know, I tend to do, I, I like these ones where he's facing off against some interlocutor who can actually more or less go toe to toe with him. Um, so those, those are a few examples. How do I take my coffee uh, with milk in it? You know, I'm uh, a good Wisconsin patriot in that in that sense, right? Supporting our local industry. Um, I like my coffee very strong, but with with milk, and that's that's pretty much it. Uh, what are my thoughts on Julius Avola? People ask this almost every time. I don't have any. Uh, I'd have to spend time reading him. <laughs> Here's a great one, Max. What is your favorite barnyard? animal so we're putting aside like barn cats because if you ask me what's my favorite animal i'd say a cat right but you know we'll put aside barn cats um favorite barnyard animal um i mean i can tell you what it wouldn't be it definitely wouldn't be a goat uh uh and it wouldn't be a pig um what else do we have I mean, I like, I like horses, but they're, they're a lot of maintenance. They're pretty dumb. Um, barnyard. You know, I mean, I don't like chickens, so I'm not going to say those either. And I can't say the farm dog. I guess the cow, you know? I, and bison are kind of cool, too. You see bison farms. So, all right. Um Adam asks another one. What are your thoughts on the hard problem of consciousness? I don't really have uh, uh, thoughts on that. I'm not really bothered by it, and I don't I don't spend much time worrying about the the problem of consciousness unless I have to teach it. You know, the hard problem of consciousness is how do you get how do you get uh, uh, consciousness as something that's distinctive out of you know something that's that's not consciousness, right? Um, and, and there's so many other people working on that. It's not something I I worry about. 
Uh, Wah, do you think Plato thought artists to be useless or at least more useless than not given his views on the superiority of nature to art? Plato himself was an artist. Um, so there's a bit of irony in his condemnation of mimetic art because he himself is writing philosophical dialogues. Um, he thinks that art needs to have a proper place um, and that we have to have the right approach to it. As a matter of fact, when you when you read the Republic, and if you only focus on certain passages, be like, oh, I kicked the poets out of the city, and look how he's saying, you know, the the um, artist is is not as good as the craftsman. Yes, that's all true, but even the craftsman is not that great because he's just copying the ideal form. Um, so the artist would have to be, you know, sort of brought into the proper perspective. Um, William Stevenson, would I be open to further discussing depression, anxiety in the future? Yeah, very much so. Uh, as a matter of fact, during like, you know, Mental Health Awareness Week, I was planning on shooting a video on depression and just didn't get to it because I was too busy. I wanted to do like an update video about like where I am because I think the, the one I shot about, about depression was about five years ago. And, you know, I, I've long since gone off of antidepressants and I'm generally doing you know, better, although I have some, some days that are quite rough. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd definitely be doing more personal videos later on. Oh, yeah, there's a baby ducks. Yeah, I wouldn't pick geese. Geese are terrible. They're, they're an awful kind of creature. You don't want to, you know, they'll go after little children and stuff. Um, Colin, are, are, am I going to cover the Poirot series in my fiction videos? I have no plans to cover Agatha Christie. Um, if I was going to do any mystery stuff, I would probably do uh, Chesterton's Father Brown and uh, Arthur Conan Doyle's uh, Sherlock Holmes stuff. But um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't plan on 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 that. I don't know. I, I suppose I could stick something like that in there because I guess. Is detective fiction speculative fiction? Maybe in a way. Um, yeah. Um, proof architect. What does this passage from Beyond Good and Evil mean? The falseness of a judgment is to us not necessarily an objection to a judgment. It is here that our new language perhaps sounds strangest. Um, yeah, I mean... For a lot of people, saying a judgment is false, that's the end of the story. Well, we're done with that one, you know. But it could be that something is, is false, but it's still very interesting, revealing, right? And you got to remember that for, for Nietzsche, truth in, in um, his theory of, about stuff, truth, there, there's a couple different meanings to truth in Nietzsche, and they need to be disentangled from each other. But you could say that truth, in a sense, lies on a a basis of falsification, of, of agreement to, to count certain falsehoods as, as true. So that's, that's not necessarily a reason to rule it out. Um, here's one from Rainy Chief. Should one seek justice when someone has wronged you, even if doing so only causes more problems? Is there a duty to fight for what's right, even if said on injustice only targets oneself? Um, sometimes yes, sometimes no. I mean, depends on what the wrong is and what the actual, you know, achievement is in, in, in imposing some sort of justice. I think you also have to be very careful in, in not reading more justice into your side than, than uh, there actually is. Um, and, and should you seek justice when someone has wronged you, even if doing so only causes more problems? If it only causes more problems, then probably not, you know? Um, but if there's if there's other values at play, then perhaps it could be important. Um, Nimi07, you need to watch ContraPoints. It's not only philosophy, it's an art. Well, I would have to have the time, right? So people are always recommending things to me. Um, if, if you want me to, to have the time to do that, that's what Patreon is for, right? Because the more that I, I have independent support, the less time I have to spend on money-making projects to keep an income going for my household, my children, you know, uh, planning for retirement, all that sort of stuff. Um, it's just the way it works, right? I don't, I don't, I'm not supported by a university and I'm not supported by the government. Um, 
Louise asks, have you read Byung Chul Han? No, I've, I've never even heard of him. I, I wonder who that is. Uh, it could be interesting. Uh, Rory Dunnigan, do you have any comments on film or art in general as a philosophical medium? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I do actually have some, some, some thoughts. I think it's very tough to do philosophy well in film uh, or, or in other artistic um, genres. And one reason for that is there's, there's, there's a lot of ways in which people do basic, let's call it cliche philosophy, right? They depict um, somebody in a circumstance and you know, what's existentialism? Oh, look how sad he is and his life is kind of going to crap and, and he's having a crisis. And, well, that's already been done, you know? Um, it, it's difficult to do well. I think a lot of people think that they can just study a little bit of philosophy and, you know, grab a few ideas and then find some way to represent it visually and it's going to automatically come across. And that's very rarely the case. The other thing that's important is when you're doing philosophy well in, uh, like, say, literature, it's often happening through the dialogue. And dialogue writing is itself a, a real skill that I don't think a lot of people have mastered. So, yeah. Uh, awful philosophy. What are my thoughts on Husserl's epoche? How is it done concretely? Can't quite wrap my head around him, but I find the thought intriguing. So the epoche is another way of translating is bracketing, right? And what you're doing is you're sort of suspending your, your um, natural, what he calls the natural attitude, this, this natural tendency to think that things actually are the way that, that they're being depicted and to withdraw not your attention, but your assent from them, and just see how they're actually presenting themselves to you. I think the epoche is uh, one way of doing phenomenology, um, but I don't think you have, to, you have to do it that way. I mean, it's interesting. If you read Merleau-Ponty's Phenomenology of Perception, the beginning of it, he also talks about like loosening the intentional threads. He's got a somewhat different model um, than, than Husserl does. Um, Heidegger also talks about like letting beings be, letting the phenomena present themselves to you. Uh, Max Scheler, another great phenomenologist, has another way of doing it. Uh, Gabriel Marcel, you know. The key thing is to actually allow things to present themselves to you without um, allowing yourself to start, start drawing all sorts of inferences or making them be this way. Um, and, and I think that was what was going on also with Bergson's attention to the immediate data or givens of consciousness in the book that gets translated as time and free will, but it should be actually translated as the immediate givens of consciousness. I think that's the same thing that Maurice Blondel is doing with his method of imminence as well. Um, so I don't think you have to do it Husserl's way, but a lot of people like to, you know. Uh, Ash, what do I think of Averroes and how it compares to Thomism? How Averroes' uh, system, I guess, compares to Thomism. Again, Thomism, man, whose Thomism are you talking about? Because, you know, ask 10 Thomists uh, what, what Thomas says, you're going to get 10 different answers because there's all different schools of Thomism out there. <clears throat> and you might say, well, I just mean, you know, the school of St. Thomas himself. Well, that's hard to find. <laughs> um, because almost everybody has some sort of interpretation that they got from whoever it is that they got introduced to Thomism from. Um, Averroes is an interesting thinker. Uh, for those who don't know, this is, this is Averroes, or that's the Latin version of Ibn Rushd. He is one of the, the later Islamic thinkers who used Aristotle. Thomas is reacting to him. Obviously, Thomas is, is you know, uh, writing in a, in a different context. He's, he's got all these other Christian thinkers and, and other ancient thinkers who he's bringing into to confluence in his works. Um, I don't spend a lot of time reading Averroes. Um, there are some people just down the street because we have here, you know, in Milwaukee, we have the Marquette University uh, Aquinas and the Arabs Project. And so that's usually where I get to hear the most about Averroes or, or any of the other Islamic thinkers. Um, so I, I don't really have a, a way of comparing them. 
Now, here's a question. How can I possibly answer this? The proof architect. Who's better at using predicate logic? Philosophers or mathematicians, logicians? How would I know? You know, it's not like we have a, a logic games where we're like, you know, timing you. Ah, solve, you know, solve these things using predicate logic. <laughs> um, I think people use it as a tool because that's all it is. And it, it's like any other thing. If you use it a lot, you get very good at doing it. If you only use it once in a while, then you're probably going to be kind of rusty. Sort of like using a, a lawnmower, you know. So, um, Mike Garber just asserts good and evil superseded by pragmatism. Uh, depends on whose pragmatism you're talking about. There's a lot of pragmatisms out there. Um, I know William James wouldn't say that, and neither would Peirce, uh, uh, and I don't think even John Dewey would. So, uh, I, I'm not sure what kind of pragmatism you have in mind. Jeff Sullivan, I'd like to read some philosophy of language off the top of your head. Could you recommend a good place to start? Um, Plato's Cratylus. I mean, if you're going to do it in historical perspective, that probably is one of the places you should start with. Uh, and then read some some Aristotle. You know, he's got a lot of remarks about, about language in the books that comprise what we call the Organon. Um, I mean, if you want more contemporary stuff, there's all sorts of like – readers out there. Um, I mean, if you want to jump into contemporary stuff, um, maybe get Umberto's Echo, Semiotics and the Theory of Language. Good book. Echo's good at explaining things to you and introducing new stuff. Um, I will say one thing about philosophy of language. You know, Ferdinand de Saussure, the great linguist, one of the founders of structural uh, linguistics, um, said that in order to understand language and be a linguist, you need to study multiple languages. Um, and I think he's totally right. Whenever I run into these people who say that they've got a degree in linguistics or they're studying linguistics, and I'm like, great, what languages are you studying? Like, I only know English or a little bit of Spanish. You know, I'm like, well, that person's going to be a waste of my time. I'm not going to bother even talking with them. Because how do you get to learn about language if you're not actually studying different ways in which language is articulated and works, you know, it'd be sort of like saying, yeah, you know, um, I'm going to be a mechanic and you're like, great. What kind of cars do you like to work on? I only work on Pontiacs. Oh, that's nice. So you've only got that frame of reference. <laughs> you know, <laughs> What the hell are you going to do when you work on my Ford or, you know, let alone this Fiat that keeps breaking down. Um, how are you going to make it make sense out of that? So, you know, I, I would say if you want to do philosophy of language, it's really, really helpful to have some background in, in studying languages and studying them in a serious way where, like, you learn the actual grammar and history of the language, not just, like, take a bunch of language tapes or something like that. So um, here's another question by 3 by 4 Architecture. Have you read Cretian Call and Response? No, I'm not even sure what that what that is, quite frankly. Um, some of these questions, I wish I, I had a better background. Um, proof architect, if you had enough support, would you consider be opening a more formal first order, second order logic section to your YouTube channel? So I have a, a other YouTube channel, smaller one, that I started a while back and, and started loading up with videos and then kind of petered out as I a uh, lot, you know, didn't have the time called um, critical thinking, logic, and argumentation. That's where I would do that sort of thing. And I actually do have that built into my Patreon. Um, you know, you have different levels. Like when I hit this level of support, I'm going to do this thing. When I hit this level of support, I'm going to do this thing. That's actually in there. If you go to the goals, like it was up in the left, top left corner, and you click on those. I'm going to start building out stuff in the critical thinking, argumentation, logic channel if I if I reach a high enough level of support because then I'll have the time to do it, you know. Um, and yeah, I definitely do stuff on on first order, second order logic. I mean, I have plans to do all sorts of things if I end up um, doing something with that channel. All right, um, J to B to Nick. What do I think of the theory? Plato's theology and philosophy is heavily influenced by the Egyptians. I think it's bonk. I think a lot of these so and so was totally influenced by this are usually bonk in general. Uh, they rely on so much could be, should be, maybe this sort of logic. And I've never, 
you know, I've looked at some of these these arguments, and I've never found them remotely convincing. Um, uh, Sosex, what to read after Kant? Um, well, there's a lot of things you could read after Kant. You could go backwards and read people that you missed. You could um, read, you know, contemporaries of Kant. Um, you could read some of the other German idealists. You could jump totally ahead to somebody, a present day Kantian, like say, Honora O'Neill. Um, see what they make of him. That, that could be interesting. Um, Chip, who are some of the well-known writers who are not usually thought of as philosophers that you think are philosophically interesting and significant? Um, that's a good question. First person who comes to mind right off the bat, Rainer Maria Rilke. Um, I th this is something I've meant to do work on for a while, and I just keep getting sidetracked. Um, Rilke has this really interesting conception of what, he, what we translate as solitude. Uh, in German, it's Einsamkeit. And it, 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 there's, in essence, a metaphysics of solitude worked out in his letters and in um, sort of touched upon in his poetry. He actually does, he, and there, by the way, there's two different meanings to solitude or Einsamkeit. It can mean being on your own and exploring this sort of space within yourself and in your relation to other things. And it can also mean loneliness and isolation. Uh, he's got two poems actually uh, that, that touch on different aspects of this. One is called Einsamkeit and it ends with two lovers like facing away from each other as the rain is coming down um, being lonely in the same bed. Um, now, you know, this is the sort of stuff that, that explains why Rilke is an existentialist thinker, because these are really important existentialist things. Um, I mean, Philip K. Dick is not thought of as a philosopher. I love Philip K. Dick. Uh, he does a lot of great, he does more philosophy in his stories in interesting ways than many of my contemporary peers do in all of their their work, I would say. Um, somebody else who I really enjoy, uh, Borges, you know, writes short stories. I'm not so big on his poetry. I like his short stories and essays more. Um, really interesting stuff going on in there. Dostoevsky, of course, lots of philosophical discussion going on in his works. Um, Iris Murdoch, who also was a philosopher. <laughs> so, okay, yeah. I mean, we would expect her her novels to be to be kind of filled with philosophy, <laughs> wouldn't we? <laughs> um, but those are those are some of the people that I, I really like. Um, all right. Normally, I, I I go pretty far over, but today I'm not going to be able to go too long. In part because I've got some other things I have to do. So I'll, I'll hang on for about maybe another 10 minutes or so and try to answer as many questions as I can. Uh, Sozix asks a question that I don't really have a good answer to. What's the difference between being, becoming, and process? I think that's probably based in some sort of process philosophy view. Being would be understood as being very static, and then becoming is dynamic, and process is the process of becoming. Um, but you, you could look at it in different other ways as well, you know. Um, Oh, here's a good question. Robert, should we care what others think of us? Whether people think we're wise or foolish, should we care? P people think we're wise, that can easily become part of our ego. Yeah, I mean, should we, I guess I would rephrase it and say, should we care what what everybody thinks of us? Or should we should we care about every sort of thing people think about us? There are definitely some people that who whose opinions should matter more than others. I mean, this is something actually discussed in the Credo, uh, that going back to that earlier question about which Platonic dialogues do you think are kind of underrated? There's this wonderful discussion in there between Socrates and Credo about whether we should care what the many think or the wise. And notice Socrates doesn't say, we shouldn't care about what anybody thinks. He says, we should care about what the people who actually know what the hell they're talking about think. Because if, if we think that something is good and they tell us, no, it's bad, then um, we should probably take their, their views into consideration. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, we we should care about what some people think of us, and we should think we should care about um, why they think the way that they do. But should we be really invested in what, say, public perception of us is? Probably not. You know, um, I mean, one of the, I'll tell you something personal. When I was a kid, and this really went on into my 20s, but it was tapering off, thank God. I had this feeling that, that a lot of other people do, that like everything that I was doing, somebody was probably paying attention to it and watching it. And so because people so easily misunderstand or mistake what you're doing, I would sometimes like do things deliberately to like show I was doing this or, or show that, that I thought things this way. And I spent so much time and energy on that sort of bullshit that nobody cares about. I, it was so liberating finding out that most people are not paying attention most of the time. You don't really have to care what they, they think about stuff because they're, they, they don't have any good basis for what they're saying, right, um, or thinking. Um, now, of course, you do have to be prudent, right? If you're going into a job interview and you're like, man, I'm not going to care what anybody thinks of me. I'm going to wear whatever the hell I want and put my feet up on the desk, <laughs> smoke a cigarette. You know, you're not going to get the job unless they're looking for somebody to do that sort of thing. Or they're like, wow, this guy's got some moxie. <laughs> you know? uh, so obviously there are some cases where you do have to care what people think. Um, but there's, there's, there's ways of doing that. You know, do you go into the job interview like totally nervous about what this flunky across the desk uh, thinks of you, it, it, you know, as a, as a human being? No, you care about what they think about you as a candidate because that's all that really matters. So, yeah. Oh, wow. Proof architect again. What philosophy do you need under your belt before you can start tackling Derrida's of grammatology? Well, um, good question. And we can broaden this to think about other difficult texts. You might want to look at um, who is being referenced, right? So right off the bat, you know, who do you notice is being talked about? Jean-Jacques Rousseau. You need to, you probably need to read a good bit of Rousseau's stuff or else the things that Derrida is, or Derrida is saying about Rousseau probably aren't going to make so much sense. Um, Claude Levi-Strauss be a good one as well, right? Um, Plato. Uh, and, you know, you could go on and on and look at, well, who is he actually referencing? I can tell you that for Derrida, for early Derrida, phenomenology is very important, and there's a lineage that goes from Husserl to Heidegger to Levinas. Those are thinkers. Um, obviously, some of the thinkers that they're engaging with, like, like Kant, you don't have to know Kant inside and out to, to understand Derrida, but it, it sure can't hurt. And then he's very influenced by language, linguistic philosophy. So you would want to read De Saussure. Um, you would, uh, Claude Levi-Strauss fits into that, that sort of spectrum as well. Um, you know, you probably would want to read um, Jakobsen. And probably you want to go read Peirce as well, um, doing a different kind of, of semiotics. Um, and there's, there, you know, there's quite a few other thinkers in there too, that would be would be good too. Um, couldn't hurt to read some Marx. That, that's always kind of looming in the background for Derrida, I'd say. Um, Hegel. You don't need to read all of Hegel. <laughs> I mean, you'd be screwed if you did, right? Um, all right. Uh, let me see what's next. Thomas, what's your relationship with Massimo Pigliucci? You like his book on Stoicism. Massimo and I are colleagues and, and friends. Um, I would say we probably get a chance to spend time in conversation a few times a year, uh, in part because we're both very busy, um, but we always have great, great talks. Um, he's a great host. And uh, his book on Stoicism, I mean, you can read my, re or not read, you can watch my review of it. I thought it was pretty good. Um, it's, it's, you know, obviously there's a lot of things that are left out, but, but he's not trying to do everything. And I, I like the, um, the dramatic, uh, what would you call it, the, the technique of having it be sort of a dialogue between him and Epictetus. I thought that was pretty smart on his part. 
Uh, Massimo's written a lot of books, so he's 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 quite good at that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, we're we're both members of the Modern Stoicism team. He and I get along very well. Um, sometimes we shoot emails back and forth about different ideas. Um, I would say that you know when it comes to like how to how to steer Stoicism through the shoals of of politics and culture, he's probably more on the left than I am. I'm pretty pretty much in the middle and parks I don't fit in well with left or right. Um, he's more, more on the left, but you know, he's a great interlocutor. Um, Adam Titor, what makes a philosophical concept, mathematical theorem or physical theory difficult to understand? Ooh, that's, these are still teachable, but what makes them difficult? I, I think there could be a lot of things that could make them difficult. Some could be that they presuppose a kind of terminology and framework of thought. Like I, I, I see this happen a lot with Kant, who I, I teach, you know, pretty frequently. Um, I don't know how many times I've taught the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals to students who haven't had any philosophy background. And the key is to get them to actually like crack the code and see what the hell he's actually saying. <laughs> And then they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I get that, you know. Another problem is when philosophers don't provide enough examples. Um, that can make it quite difficult. Or they, they pack the everything in too, too tight, you know. Um, sometimes we need like a little break in between, you know, reading stuff. That's why reading Hegel can be so difficult. Um, what else? You know, with Kant, I'll use that as an example too. So he's got these great remarks about happiness and the goal. You know, the, the goal of ethics for Kant is duty. It's not happiness. And he thinks that we're not, you know, that we're not set up in such a way that, that um, following duty and, and, and rationality will actually make us happy in the sense of satisfaction of our desires and inclinations. Um, we do have to postulate that things are that way, but but he, he doesn't really think things are that way. And students will be like, is he serious about this? And he'll be like, yeah, he's serious about this. And that, is he serious about this? That's kind of a roadblock for a lot of students. They're like, he can't possibly mean that. And that means they don't understand it. To, to understand a position that's like radically different from what you think is um, quite... Uh, quite tricky. So, um, all right. Uh, let me read down. Um, this thing scroll. Once I get all these questions packed in here, it kind of gets out of control as far as the scrolling. Okay. Uh, Harris Akbar, thoughts on Eastern Orthodoxy versus Roman Catholicism. Well, my personal view, uh, the versus is a mistake. Um, they're all part of one big communion if they decide to be so. And I think a lot of the uh, distinctions between them turn out to be um, misunderstandings of the other person's position. You know, I see this a lot as, a, as an Anselm scholar. Um, there, there's a lot of, you know, pretty crappy Eastern Orthodox takes on Anselm, who was, you know, part of the Council of Bari where the, the things were being debated between Orthodox and, and, and Catholic uh, thinkers in the uh, 12th century. Um, but usually they just don't understand what Anselm is saying, and often it's tendentious. They haven't actually read, you know, what he has to say, or they've only read it in order to refute it. And I think there's a, a lot of that on the Catholic side. And that happens, by the way, within Catholicism about other Catholic thinkers, you know. So, yeah, in, in the, the early 20th century, you have all these people being condemned as modernists, including Maurice Blondel, the guy I did my dissertation on. Uh, who definitely were not, and it was other Catholics who had a beef with them. So I think a lot of, I think a lot of the versus there comes about because of the human failings of the people involved in, in doing that. Um, and I would, you know, I would, I would go further. I would say uh, you've got, you know, you've got uh, not just Roman Catholicism because Catholicism is much broader than just the Roman. I mean, I used to go to a Maronite right church myself. Um, there's a number of different rites within within the Catholicism, 
And then you've got the Eastern Orthodox family of churches. And then we've got all the other Eastern Christians as well. The Assyrian Church of the East, you know, the Ethiopian Church, the Antiochian, uh, you know, the Coptic Church. These all matter to the Malabar, you know, Syriac Christians. Um, they all have very rich traditions to draw upon and, and interesting thinkers. I wish I had the time to actually spend on, on them, but I, I often don't. So, all right, let me see what else we got here. Um, the scrolling got a little bit screwed up. I'm not going to be able to get to everybody's questions, it looks like. Uh, so I'm going to start jumping around a bit. I'll spend maybe another uh, 10 minutes or so. Wow. On this. Um, there we go. Um, is it honest to call Aristotle a nominalist? Wouldn't the logical conclusion of his moderate realism be nominalism? Aristotle is not a nominalist, uh, not in the sense that, that, you know, Occam or, you know, early modern thinkers are nominalists. So, you know, they're, they're often reacting against Aristotle. Um, Rabbi Rabbit, is it wrong to label Kierkegaard as Protestant or Lutheran as is so oftenly done while he has harshly criticized them both? No, it's it's not wrong to say that he was raised as a Lutheran, uh, and it's not wrong to say that he was a Protestant. You know, being a Protestant basically means uh, being post-reformational and not being part of the earlier, uh, more apostolic churches, including Catholic, Orthodox, Eastern uh, Christian. You know, like we just mentioned a moment ago, and you know. It, there's a thing that we can call the Protestant principle following Tillich, which is, you know, once you open the, the doors to like, everybody can criticize everything. Well, they do. You know, So Kierkegaard is, is a critic of the, the Danish church of his time, but that doesn't mean that he's not a Protestant Christian. Um, let's see. Ro Thomas Moore, you should get on the right show with Robert Wright. I'd like to see you guys talk. I, I don't know that show, but I'm I'm always willing to go on and talk with uh, interlocutors from different stuff. So if you know how to make that happen, you know, uh, send an email, and and that would be kind of kind of interesting. Uh, Fizura, Philosophica, are there any interesting Romanian philosophers? Uh, Merca Eliad comes to mind. Um, I think that that he's he's pretty interesting. Uh, I've taught his stuff in in class before. Um, Scroll down a bit past some of these. Um, do, do, do. Um, ah, Signor Pomodoro. Are, am I interested in philosophy of mathematics? If so, which authors do you particularly enjoy reading? I used to be very interested in it when I was a philosophy and mathematics major in uh, <clears throat> undergraduate. And I was mostly doing stuff in like, you know, foundations of logic and, and uh, thinking about what what could in fact be um, represented mathematically either, uh, well, so, so, I, so, you know, what authors was I reading at the time? Uh, sort of a wide range, including people like John Stuart Mill who thought you could make mathematics empirical, you know, uh, all the way through to, you know, like like Hofstadter and his uh, Gerda Lescher Bach book, which we spent a whole semester on, by the way, in a seminar. Haven't done much with it for a long time, but my son, Matthew, who's 11, is very interested in infinity and in a few other issues and concepts in the um, sphere of philosophy and mathematics where they, they coincide. So he and I actually do have some plans uh, this coming month in July. When, when he's going to be visiting to um, do some research together. I'm going to have him like reading Cantor because he, he's talking, he, he watches like game theory and stuff like that. I don't know what, what, if they do a good job or not explaining this sort of stuff, but um, we're going to do uh, some videos on the philosophy of mathematics together. Um, he, he loves editing as well. So, so that'll be a great research project for us. Um, 
Captain Yasa, favorite Graham Greene novel. Got into Green through reading philosophy. My favorite one is The Power and the Glory, about the whiskey priest and in, 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 caught behind the lines in revolutionary Mexico. Um, that, yeah, that is definitely my, my absolute favorite green although i really like green and there's it's hard to find a bad green novel um so yeah um do, do, do. Let me skip down a bit i'm sorry for those that i'm not getting to but we have so many questions here uh oh here's a great question from david is your wife a philosopher if so do you think you could date someone who isn't well i don't plan to date <laughs> I have a wife, you know, uh, you're speaking hypothetically, of course, like if, uh, if my wife wasn't in the picture, or if I, you know, God forbid she, she died and, you know, am I going to like date somebody who's not a philosopher? And, and the answer would be, uh, you know, hypothetically, yes, because being a philosopher is not the absolutely deal killer thing. I think, you know, I mean, you can be a philosopher and be a total jerk. I know a lot of colleagues like that. Uh, people who I wouldn't trust to walk down a dark alley with, let alone want to be involved in a relationship with. Now, is my wife a philosopher? Um, yeah, I would say she actually is. But, you know, it's not because she, she's just studying philosophy, which she, in fact, is doing through European graduate school. She's working on her dissertation, uh, uh, writing on, on Martin Heidegger. Um, but also because, you know, she's she's doing the sort of st stuff. She's thinking about the sort of things that philosophers do. How do things work? You know, how do we move from the lower level of generality to a higher level of generality? But, you know, I think in, that that's a, a way of understanding philosophy that's a bit more generic. So, again, somebody like Rainer Maria Rilke, the poet, would be a philosopher in that respect as well. Um so yeah, she, she yeah she's definitely a, a philosopher, um, and we sometimes you know not as often as, as she or I would like. Sometimes we get the chance to go over philosophical texts together and to discuss them and go into detail. It's probably something we need to make more more time for together. Um, Greg Sadler fan, have you ever thought about doing videos on theology and parts of the Bible? Um, yeah, I mean. I could see going at the Bible from sort of like a comparative literature standpoint uh, rather than some sort of doctrinal standpoint. I think there's probably people out there doing plenty of that already. Um, and, you know, theology, yeah, I'd probably like look at it like this is this person's theology, this is this person's theology, just present it the way I do. But that would, uh, you know, I would have to have the time for that. And and I don't, I don't have that much time. So, um all right. Let's see what else we get. Um, oh, here's a good one from Lucas. What do you think about Bataille? Uh, Bataille is that 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 fun, crazy friend that you've got who will take you out on a bender. And, you know, you wake up in the morning uh, wondering what the hell just happened. <laughs> he's, he's, a, he's a cool thinker. I like his work. Um, I, he's not somebody I, I really have been able to, like, do any writing on <laughs> at any point. Uh, but there's, uh, you know, I mean, there's so many thinkers I could say I haven't been able to, to uh, uh, write on at any, any point as well. Um, all right. Um, a lot of stuff about different thinkers am i interested in them or interested in those people uh, here's a good question from vladimir my teacher tells me what's true for me may not be true for another person is he correct it depends on the thing there are definitely some sentences that trivially are not true for you that are true for me. I'll give you an example. I'm Greg Sadler, right? False for you, right? You're not, if you enunciate it, you're not Greg Sadler. I, I am. Um, now you can say, well, you know, you believe uh, 
when we put this this out there, you could say, I believe that the statement, I am Greg Sandler, is correct when, when this guy over here says it. And sure, that's a way around that. Um, there are, there are going to be some things that are subjective. And then there are some other things where somebody's right and somebody's wrong. Um, and the key is to be able to figure out, okay, which one is which. You don't want to go like all the way into moral relativism or, or epistemological relativism. Eh, it's all relative. Anything could be up for grabs because that's just incoherent. I mean, that's not even worth, well, you, I mean, you could spend your time on it, but I, I think that's not really worth spending your time on. Um, but we do have to recognize a certain amount of uh, relativity to things, don't we? Um, let's see here. I'm getting a little bit close to the needing to, to get to the other stuff. Um, hmm. D Dane, what do I think of Schopenhauer? Should he be studied solely as an influence in Nietzsche? Should his ideas stand on their own? Schopenhauer is somebody who has been getting more and more attention lately, and I mean in the last 20 years, but he's still, I would say, often like viewed incorrectly as just like an adjunct to Nietzsche. Um, he's, he's worth reading, and I enjoy reading him. I, I think if you're going to do it, you should actually read, you know, Fourfold Root or World as Will, as Re World as Will and Representation um, rather than just reading, you know, essays or, or things like that. So I think that that would be quite quite good um, to, to spend time on. Um, do, 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 do. Let's see, what else can I quickly knock out? Um, oh, here's a good question. Um, uh, where was that? It was one about Wittgenstein. Yeah. Do I need to read the Tractatus before the philosophical investigations? Couldn't hurt. Um, the Tractatus is a pretty quick read. Fairly straightforward. Kind of boring, actually, in much of the middle stuff because he's really kind of go just going over how, how logic works and how, how uh, sentences would be representational. Um, but, it, I mean, it's good to know because, in part, you know, he's reacting against his former views. So, yeah, I think that could be, that could be good. Um, all right. Let me uh, take uh, one more. Um, something I can easily address. Um, if there is one <laughs> like that. Uh, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say this one. Uh, from David. Have I read Moses Maimonides? Uh, yeah, I, he's, you know, he's within the sort of Aristotelian tradition. He's, he's somebody who is important for medieval philosophy. Uh, Maimonides is, is quite interesting. Um, and un, unfortunately, with this Aristotle and the Aristotelian tradition conference coming up at Marquette, just down the road that I'll be going to Monday through Wednesday, there aren't going to be any papers on Maimonides this time around, but there have been in the past some, some pretty good ones. Um, and, and I enjoy uh, reading them, but unfortunately he's one of those people who I don't really have a lot of time to read. So, you know, like everything else, what are you, what are you going to do? You know? Um, all right. So I am going to, it's 125 here. Uh, I have another thing I have to host at 2, uh, so I've got to get on. But thanks for all of your questions and comments. Uh, if, if I didn't get to them, uh, I you know, sorry about that, but it, it, there's so many. <laughs> I can't always get to, to every single one. Um, we'll be having another one of these, as usual, next month. So you can go to my um, Facebook page. Uh, or I always post it on Patreon as well when these are coming up. Um, other than that, 
have a great weekend, and I will see you guys uh, in some other event.